let's get into our our lesson when will the rapture happen I've mentioned to you that there are a number of views as to when the rapture is going to happen. And we've been studying now for about three or four weeks. Last week we had a Middle East report, but uh, before that, about three weeks, we've had on, on the subject of the rapture. And I have today, I have, I don't know if I'll teach them, but I have two more lessons on the rapture uh, that I've already got done. And, uh, but uh, we'll see if I end up uh, teaching them. I just enjoy studying them. But uh, when it comes to end time prophecy, the differences between theologians and uh, novices like myself doesn't start with the rapture. The differences don't start with the rapture. They start with what we call the millennium, which is the thousand year reign of Christ. The millennium. And there are three views when it comes to what we think about the millennium. And the reason they're different is because Jesus Christ is going to come back one of these days to this earth. That's after the rapture, but it's to this earth. And the question is, when, in relationship to the millennium, is he coming back? Now, I'm sure that every one of you think that Jesus is coming back before the millennium. And it doesn't surprise me if everyone I hear believe that. I do, too. But not, every, but not every Christian does. So there are three views, and I'll put them on the screen here. There are amillennial, postmillennial, and premillennial. And they're really just two different ways in which they disagree. One is, when does it happen in relationship to the thousand-year reign of Christ? Or, when do you think the second coming is going to occur. And it's very obvious to us that uh, we think the Lord's coming soon. But those early Christians really thought they were going to, he was going to come in their lifetime. For instance, I, I kind of feel that the Apostle Paul thought that Jesus was going to come in his lifetime. For instance, give you a scripture. First, I don't have it in my notes. First uh, Corinthians 15, verse 51 and 52. It says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we sh shall all. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be made alive. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the last trump, the trump will sound, and, and the dead shall be raised, and, and we which are alive shall re be. He uses the word we in there. We shall be changed. It's not like Paul was saying, well, okay, the dead will be raised, but we are going to be changed. Uh, so I think there was an early, but down through the centuries, say three or four hundred years, uh, people again began to think, well, he's not really coming soon. And we'll talk about that when we get to the second coming in a minute. Uh, not in a minute, in a few months. Uh, so let's go over these quick, quickly, these three views of the millennium. The first one is the amillennialism. They believe that there is no millennium. No thousand year reign of Christ. This branch of prophecy does not believe in the literal tribulation seven years, as most all of us probably do. They don't believe in the rapture, and they don't believe in the Antichrist. They, believe the Bible? Oh, yeah. they do believe in the Bible, and I'll show you at the end, if I have time, men and women of God who hold these different positions, and they are men and women of God. They believe that the biblical phrase, a thousand years, just means a long time. And for them, the present time that we're in, call it the millennium, call it the thousand years, this long time is all the time since Jesus left until he comes back again. That's the long time. 
the thousand years, they would call it. Actually, this was the dominant view of Christianity for over a thousand years during the Dark Ages. One of them, well, two of the theologians early in Christian, we call them uh, church fathers. One was uh, Origen. He, you might not know as much about him, but Augustine was the other one, and maybe you know about Augustine. They both were raised in a theological school that was held in Alexandria, Egypt, and they believed in interpreting the scripture allegorically, almost entirely. They were one of the first three theological schools. One was in Rome, one was in, I want to say Jerusalem, but it's not. It's probably uh, Antioch. Uh, where Paul left and went on his missionary journeys. Anyway, so they don't believe in a future millennium. Then we come to the post-millennial. Adherence, adherence to this almost in, descri uh, ascribed to the allegorical, but some things they take literally. And <clears throat> in my mind, Anytime you have a choice between choosing one or the other, you're going to fall into problems. Because you don't, how do you choose which is allegorical and which is literal? And, but this uh, group does. Uh, they do believe in a literal thousand year reign of, of Christ. And they believe that Christ will not be here during that millennium. They believe he will be in heaven and ruling from heaven. And he will come after the millennium is finished, thus called the post-millennials. This view holds that the millennium will be established not by Christ, but by the church. The, like the all millennialists, they also do not believe in the literal tribulation of seven years. This view flourished greatly in the 18th and 19th centuries when literally hundreds of missionary societies began to bloom. And they felt that the church was going to evangelize the world so much that it would become Christianized and then Jesus would come. So the millennium is the churches going out into all the world and winning all the world for Jesus Christ. And when that happened, Jesus would come back. And there were literally hundreds of missionaries. There was much optimism for, for Christianity. But when World War I came along, it hit them hard. And when World War II happened, it almost de destroyed them. And you find very few now today that uh, for hold this view. Rather, as the scripture says, sin will wax worse and worse until the day comes. Then we have the pre-millennial. And if you're wondering, I'm in this group. This view holds that Christ will return to earth to set up a kingdom for 1,000 years. This view also takes a literal interpretation of Bible prophecy. Premillennialists believe in a rapture and a seven year tri tribulation. But the, but the differences between each of these is now comes into focus because there are several groups within the premillennialism that have a focus on Christ's coming, but when does Christ rapture the church? And that's the title of our lesson today. And those five positions held by various scholars of the Bible are pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, mid-tribulation, partial rapture, and pre-wrath. Pre-wrath 
rapture. The church, this group says, the church will remain on the earth and go through the entire seven-year tribulation. And there is no distinction between the timing of the rapture and the second coming of Jesus Christ. We rise to meet Christ in the air and immediately come back to earth. That's the only view that says we come immediately back to earth and don't go to heaven. When we meet, after we meet Christ in the air. Also, the church has replaced Israel. And the promises given to Israel belong to the church now. Did I put that on there? Yep. And they say the rapture is not imminent. That means that the church must go through certain events before the rapture can occur. If we ever believe that the rapture, that events must precede the rapture, then we're not, we don't believe in imminence. By the way, I do. And uh, that's one of those two lessons. I'm not sure if I'm going to teach yet, but on the subject of imminence. Next one. Of the five premillennial views, this is the one that has the least literal biblical interpretation. And there are several problems, and I'll just give two with this position. One is, it ignores many scriptures, some by Christ himself, that says the church, the body of Christ, will not go through the wrath of God. And I believe that. And the second one is, the post-tribulation position doesn't allow enough time after the rapture for the marriage supper of the Lamb and the, and the beam of judgment, the judgment in heaven of all believers, all the body of Christ. So that, that's the position of the post-tribulationist. The next one, mid-tribulation rapture. This group holds that the church will go through the first half of the tribulation after meeting Christ in the air. We, they go to heaven. We go to heaven. They term the first three and a half years as the tribulation, and the last three and a half years as the wrath of God or the great tribulation. They also call. They are, as I mentioned, they are also called the original pre-wrath rapture because they believe the rapture starts in the midpoint of the tribulation. They do not believe the church goes through any of the wrath of God. The, here's a couple positions they hold. One is that the seventh trumpet in Revelation 11 is synonymous with the last trumpet that I just quoted a minute ago from 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. Let me give that again. Where it says, I, sh we show, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound and we sh the dead shall be raised and we shall be changed. The last trump in that verse is taken as the last trump of the seven trumpets of the book of Revelation. And that happens in Revelation, the 11th chapter. For most of them, not all of them, whoops, for most of them, may already have this on it. For most of them, the rapture occurs in Revelation, the 11th chapter, verse 11 and 12. For them, the, the two witnesses that you find in Revelation are not literally people. They are synonymous with the two parts of Christianity. The dead in Christ and those which are alive and remain. So they take these two people more as spiritual, representing the church. Personally, I believe those two witnesses are real people. 
In fact, I believe the Bible gives us the name of one of them. The second one, there's some debate as to the name of that person. We'll get into that uh, later lessons. Finally, I believe the two witnesses are literal people and they don't represent the church. First of all, the two witnesses both died and they're both resurrected. How can you have that represent the church when one group dies but the other group does not die and never does and doesn't need to be resurrected at the rapture? Secondly, in Revelation, we find that the resurrection of the two witnesses occurs three verses before the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Therefore, they're really part of the sixth trumpet, not the last trumpet. So that, I think, falls apart as to be the last trump. I think I have another one on that slide. <clears throat> I don't think that they are limiting the severity of the, the seal judgments and the first six of the trumpet judgments and separating from them and saying that only the seventh and on is the real issue. All right. They believe that they will return to, to heaven after the rapture and return and Jesus will return to earth at the end of the tribulation. Now, partial rapture. I mentioned this once before and I said I'm not going to talk much about it because there's no one that I know right now that holds this view. But I, I, just in case somebody or you read something, says something about this view, they take the scripture in Hebrews the ninth chapter and 28, which reads, those who are eagerly waiting for him, he will return the second time Apart from, uh, apart from sin for salvation. They're saying that Christ only will resurrect, uh, and, excuse me, will rapture those people that are waiting for him at that particular moment. Not every Christian will be raptured at the same time. That first one, they say, does occur at the first, uh, before the tribulation, but they believe that only after others become uh, thoroughly convinced and are watching for the Lord does future raptures occur. And they believe at the end of the tribulation the Son of God comes back. I have a lot of issues with that one, but I said I wouldn't talk much on it. The next one is the pre-wrath. This is about 40 years old. I only know of two authors that, uh, that have written about this view, but I might not have gotten them all. This group holds that the church will not experience the wrath of God. They believe most of the tribulation is not the wrath of God. In fact, the first three-fourths of the, the tribulation is the wrath of man or the wrath of Satan. They hold that the wrath of God is only about 21 months in duration at the end of the tribulation. 21 months is one-fourth of the seven years. They make uh, no distinction between the Jew and the, ch and the Israel and the church. And at approximately five years, and three months of the seven-year tribulation, they call that first three-quarters of the tribulation, the, as Christ used it in Matthew 24, the beginning of sorrows. This group vigorously tries to uh, destroy the idea that the rapture is imminent. And I've seen and read many of their writings 
of how they try to say that the coming of Christ in the rapture is not imminent. Uh, <clears throat> so they do believe that we're going through some difficult times in the tribulation time, though not the wrath of God. Did I have one more? Yes. This group believes Christ will arrive to earth after the tribulation. The last view, the pre-tribulation rapture. For them, the rapture occurs be before the seven-year tribulation starts, and the church will not be here during any of the seven years of the tribulation. Once we meet Christ in the air, we go to heaven with him. We go to the place he's been preparing for us, as we read, read in, Ma in John, the 14th chapter, first three verses. He says, I will come and receive you unto myself. He says that after he says, I'm preparing a place for you. And he takes us to that place, I believe, he's been preparing for us. The church is distinct from Israel. That is, the people... It's also... I mean, let me put it this way. Uh, we're also distinct from believers of the Old Testament and the believers that come to Christ during the tribulation. This age is the church. They are not part of the church. They will be part of saved, but they're not part of the church. We'll get more into that later. We believe both halves... I gave myself away there, didn't I? I said we... Both halves of the tribulation experience the wrath of God. And that's the other lesson I have sitting out here called, When Does the Wrath Begin? That I might teach. This view holds that the rapture is imminent, that it could happen at any moment. And believers of the church age are judged in heaven following the rapture. But the nations and Israel will be judged during and at the end of the tribulation time. The pre-tribulationist position takes most of the interpretation of, of uh, prophecy, prophetic scripture, as being literal. And at the end of the tribulation, we believe that Christ is coming back. To set up his kingdom. I want to, I've said it before, I implied it just a few minutes ago, that of all these five positions, there are godly men and women that hold those different positions. My lesson next week will be why I believe the pre-tribulation rapture is the most accurate one from Scripture. But there are godly people in each of these. And I'm going to show you some of the names of people who hold these positions. Post-tribulationism. You'll find... Some of these you may not know, some of you will. Robert Gundry, George Ladd, Pat Robertson of, of uh, CBN, uh, Jim McKeever, and Walter Martin. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Aren't I? Norman Harrison is a mid-tribulationist. Sid Lowe Baxter is, and Gleason Archer. All right? The pre-wrath... I only know these two, Marvin Rosenthal and Robert Van Campen. For the pre-tribulationist view, I have Charles Ryrie, 
C.I. Schofield, Dwight Pentecost, Hal Lindsey, John MacArthur, Tim LaHaye, Jack, Jack Van Impey, John Hagee, Dr. J David Jeremiah, Grant Jeffrey, and Zola. L In the 20th chapter of Revelation, we find a strong angel. John says, I saw a strong angel coming out of heaven, and he had the keys to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And it says in verse 2 of that, he laid hold of that old dragon, that serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. One, two, thousand years. As he cast him into this bottomless pit so that he would no longer deceive the nations for a thousand years. But at the end, he would be loose for a short period. Then it says, I saw thrones. And those who sat on them were given the authority to judge. And then I saw a group. He said, I saw the souls of them that had been beheaded for their word of God and for their testimony of Jesus Christ. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That's three verses in a row that the word thousand years is mentioned. Verse two, three, and four. The next three verses also end of it, have that phrase, a thousand years. I think the thousand years is literal. There would be no reason more than once, if at all, to have mentioned the period of a thousand years without, without it becoming evident that it's, more, that it's more than just allegorical as being a long time, but being literally 1,000 years. Now, I've, read, I've quoted those verses to you to say one of these days Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years and cast in the bottomless pit. But he's not now. And like Pastor Trey in the last hour said, we need to be in, in the presence of our God because Satan's about ready, trying to destroy you. We need to pray and fast. Because that same person in which in that second ver third verse where John said that laid hold of that dragon, that serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan. You find the same words in Revelation 12. Exactly those same four descriptions. And he says of Satan. He's deceiving us if he can. He's out to get us by whatever means he can. And he is in that chapter, 12th chapter, he is called also the, the accuser of the brethren. We need, as Pastor Troy said last hour, to be plugged into the vine. Now, in his illustration, he had a branch broken off from whatever tree it came from as an example. But it's possible, I believe, and I have a, I have a tree in my front yard that would demonstrate this, the limbs are attached, but they're not drawing much fruit, much juice from the vine. They're almost dead. The rest of the tree is doing fine, but there are several verses, uh, several verses, several branches that are. I'm going to have to cut them off, but that could be us too. I hope it's, hope it's not any of you. 
You're connected to the vine. You're a believer. But you're not drawing much strength from the, from the vine. And we need to. We need to. Satan will do anything he can to turn your world upside down. And I can see it in the world today, anywhere. This week, the annual meeting that's held in Davos, Switzerland, of the World Economic Council, or Forum, I guess it's World Economic, WEF, the World Economic Forum, will be getting together to do what they are planning to do to this earth, to you and I. I'm praying God's judgment on them, personally. Now, Pastor Troy said we should also try to win them to Christ. I will, if they come into my presence. But uh, uh, this is an organization that wants to take away your liberty in Christ. They, they have stated with no uh, qualms about it that they want, they, they, in order for this world to survive, they say all religions have to come together in one. Or as one of our politicians said during the 2016 election cycle, Christians are going to have to change their ways. They're out to get you. And we need to be connected to the vine. Yes, he's coming back. Yes, he could come before we go home. And I would applaud that. I would applaud that. But if he doesn't, we have to live the rest of our days to the will of God. And I'm glad we have the Holy Spirit in us. In us to help us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can gather here in freedom, in this place, to study your word, to pray, to help each other. Thank you, Lord, that your word is true. Satan is a liar. And you are as Revelation 1 says, you are the king over all the rulers of the earth. Jesus, you are in charge. I'm glad you're in charge of our life. And we commit it to you because you know what the future holds. We don't. Go with us now as we leave this place. May your spirit continue to dwell in us. Establish our steps as they are of God to follow you in every path that you lead us. We, live, we love you. We worship you. And we look for your soon coming. In your name we pray this morning. Amen and amen. Let's start with the post-tribulation.